The salvage operation of the Bayesian superyacht has now begun, just off the coast of Porticello in Sicily, where it sank in August. Seven of the 22 people on board were killed in that incident, including Britain's biggest tech tycoon, Mike Lynch, and his 18-year-old daughter. Salvaging the yacht should help investigators find out what happened that terrible night. The principal rescue crane, the Hebo Lift 10, is one of Europe's most powerful maritime cranes, and it is being supported by the smaller Hebo Lift 2, which is loaded with diving equipment and a remote-controlled submersible. The submersible will first inspect the basin, which lies on its side, approximately 50 meters below the water's surface. Then the 72-meter mast will be sawn off, and divers will drain the fuel on board approximately 18,000 liters. They'll then attach steel cables to the yacht to create a harness, and the Hebo Lift 10 will bring it to the surface and sail to the nearby port of Termini Imeresi. Captain Nick Sloan is an engineer who works in marine salvage and is best known for leading the salvage of the Costa Concordia in 2013. Nick, what are the riskiest stages of the operation um, during the lifting phase? Yeah, well, there's a couple of, um, so initially they've got to do a proper inspection of the condition on the seabed. So no one knows exactly what happened to the yacht when she hit the seabed. Uh, if you can imagine, she's 52 meters long. She's got a very large keel that even though is retracted, is heavy. So when that hit the seabed, was any additional damage caused that you know, hasn't been um, exposed by the initial in inspection? And then from the salvage plan, they need to look at what are the hazards? So you've got floating ropes, uh, bits of mattress, pillows, bedding that could entrap a diver if he gets fouled in it. So all of that has to be identified and then they, they take those risks out of the way before the divers actually start operating on removing the mask. And then once the mask has been taken care of, then they have to introduce the rigging. So when they do that rigging, um, when they do that initial lift and they take the weight of the yacht off the seabed, that's where you'll find out if there's any additional damage that's been caused by the incident or by the impact on the seabed. So that will be a, a very slow process and they'll have the underwater ROV camera inspecting it in minute detail, going through all of the rigging points, making sure that the hull hasn't collapsed around the rigging. And then they take the full load and bring it to the surface. And then the next riskiest part is as she gets to the surface, because then you've got the full weight of the water that's entrapped in the hull. And as they get the deck to the, the, the sea level, then they'll introduce pumps and they'll start dewatering the water as they slowly lift it out. So that's a ris risky operation as well. I know that people did say that they were going to try and remove the fuel, but I don't think that uh, that is a preliminary operation. I think that might be on a case basis after their investigation. And I do believe that they might postpone that operation until she's delivered ashore. So basically the, the fuel on board is a light diesel oil and there might have been some leakage of it already. And to access those, you'd have to do what they call a hot tap. And that actually introduces more stress into the hull of the yacht and risks to the operation. So they might actually postpone the fuel recovery until she's delivered ashore and just have oil booms and uh, an oil pollution plan on the surface to take care of any leakage should that happen. Nick, why is it necessary to salvage the basin? I think, uh, well, two things. Um, a lot of people lost their lives in an extremely high profile. So there's that question of actually what happened. And then secondly, you need to have lessons learned to make sure that you know, if, if there is something that can be done better. So in this case, I think it's mainly because of the high profile and the loss of lives. Um, under Italian law, it falls under the state prosecutor of Sicily, and he wants to know what happened. So they need to recover it, and then once they recover it, they can inspect the yacht and see what could have contributed to the sudden loss um, Obviously, there was very bad weather that evening or that night. And this yacht's been around since sort of 2008. So she's well founded. She sailed the oceans. And it's hard to believe that it can go down so suddenly. So yeah. obviously, uh, something happened. 
and wow. whether it was the abnormal weather or whether it was a design fault or something that, you know, negligence on board. So they need to look at all of those factors and to do that, they need to recover the yacht and do a, a proper examination. Yeah, what will having it uh, physically uh, above, you know, the surface of the water, having it there in front of them to look at it, uh, where will they start? What are the sorts of things they'll be looking at? So you have a couple of what they call garage doors in the, in the side of the hull, and these are open to release the toys, the jet skis, small inflatables, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So those are normally closed at the end of the day. Uh, they are watertight. So obviously they want to inspect that those are closed and watertight. Uh, then above that you've got the engine room dampers, so that's where the air comes in to the turbochargers and the blowers to keep the engines running. Uh, they should have a, a degree of water protection so that you know you, when when you're sailing, uh, you do get water that ingresses or spray, but that shouldn't impact the engine room. So that will be the secondary um, in part of the investigation. And then from there, they'll go into looking at the cockpit, the saloon doors, any other openings on deck. Um, you know, they might have had ventilation uh, doors, uh, not doors, but portholes open. So they need to go through and tick off all of the items that could have caused it and then do their investigation based on the actual results that they find. Nick, have you seen any pictures, either moving or stills, uh, of the Bayesian uh, on the um, bed of the, uh, the sea? No, on the seabed itself. So basically the footage that has been taken was under the control of the Italian uh, civil defense and then obviously the state prosecutor. So that might have been released in the final stages of the tender process to the actual, um, the shortlist of tenders, the preferred operational plan. And they can actually go through it in detail, but I don't think it's enough detail for them to rely on to actually carry out the plan. And that's why as soon as they above and, and the mooring spread of the Hebo 2 is in, in, in position, that they'll do a proper survey initially with the ROV underwater cameras, and then they might even jump one or two divers to go and verify what they are seeing on the uh, on the ROV, just to double check. So in this situation, they'll check it three, four times before actually ticking off that box. You, know, you can never be too cautious when you're going to have divers that could be entrapped and also could complicate the recovery operation. Uh, this is a very expensive operation, upwards of $30 million, I hear. Who's paying for it? Uh, so. The costs fall under the owner's uh, liability insurance, uh, which is normally called a P&I club, protection and indemnity club. And in this case, it's British Marine. Uh, it's quite a large, uh, well-established UK-based um, P&I club. Uh, they've been around since the late uh, mid 1800s, so really well-established. And under maritime law in Italy, at least, uh, it's the owner. So uh, Mike Lynch's wife, uh, she owns the company that owns the yacht. So ultimately, she has responsibility for making this happen? Correct, yes. So basically what they'll do is they'll issue a wreck removal order to the owners of the casualty, whether it be a ship or, in this case, the yacht. And uh, so once you get the wreck removal order, then you hand it over to your liability underwriters and they run the whole process. So in this case, they had an international tender or, um, arrangement with a company by TMC, also based in London. And uh, they had about eight international submissions. And then those submissions were evaluated, discussed with the Italian authorities, and they all agreed on this process, which has now started this weekend. Uh, the recovery operation is expected to take about four weeks. Um, do you think that's realistic? I would imagine that they've allowed for weather interruptions in that four weeks. So this is a transition period um, between sort of spring and coming into summer, and you get a bit of uh, volatility in the weather patterns down in Sicily and, and uh, that part of the, the Mediterranean. So I would imagine that at each stage, they'll look at the weather forecast and they'll want a day or two's window of good weather before they carry out the next phase. So if the weather plays ball and they don't have to delay for any 
abnormal situation from the weather perspective, then yeah, two to three weeks should be sufficient to recover it. But obviously they've allowed a week. Um, you know, you've got no idea what happens with the weather, especially so we, these days where the weather has changed over the sort of last 10 years and you've got a plan to uh, allow for that. So by that reckoning, just briefly, we could see it um, come out of the water in the first week of June. Well, I would like to hope, hopefully it all goes well. Uh, the second, third week of May, um, you know, they should be doing the lift. Unless, of course, they find some structural damage that they have to then mitigate against. But I would imagine that the fact that the Hebo 10 has arrived safely in port and the Hebo 2 is on location, that certainly the third, fourth week of May, they should be in a, in a situation to recover her to the surface and, and deliver her ashore. Well, during that time, officials have put a 650 meter exclusion zone in place around the site. Why is that necessary? So you have a mooring spread for first the Hebo 2 for the operation, and those anchors are around it, and they would have a, a surface buoy, and they would be at least 500 meters uh, spread around it, so 10 times the water depth. And then you've got the Hebo 10 that will come to location when they're ready uh, to bring her in. And uh, the last thing you want is anyone interfering with the uh, operation by sailing in between or trying to get too close. So from a safety perspective, you need to have an area that is completely under the control of the salvage team mm. and the mooring operation of those assets. And they've also said that flying over the site is restricted unless it's more than 200 meters above the water's surface. Is that also a necessary precaution? Yeah, well, uh, you know, sort of 15 years ago, you might not worry too much about that. But now, of course, drones are, are very user friendly. And if you think of the height of the Hebo 10, um, the last thing you want is a drone flying in between the rigging just to get a close up view. It was not your drone and uh, you've got no idea where it came from or what's going on. So it just adds to the safety value. I mean, I think if you've got a helicopter that flies over 200 meters above it, that's one thing. But if you've got 10 drones coming around and interfering with the operation, then that's not only a distraction, but it actually adds to the safety risk. Nick, how did this compare, the salvage of the Bayesian compared to the salvage of the Costa Concordia, which was obviously much, much larger, but was partially, you could see it. Yeah, so, well, two things. I think the size of, of the Concordia uh, adds challenges in her particular location. She was finally balanced on two underwater reefs and in, at, at risk of collapsing and falling down into deep water. The Bayesian is relatively small from the salvage perspective, so 52 meters, but the mast and the rigging all add to the complexities. And then, of course, the unknown damage. Was there any damage when the keel and the hull hit the seabed? Hopefully not. But um, yeah, I think they're going to approach it with the same risk assessment that you do on any operation where you do inspection. You inspect it twice, three times. And then uh, if you find any risks and you have a toolbox talk and the team get together and say, OK, we have a situation. How do we mitigate it? So it's the same process, but obviously maybe not as complex. But the risks are that there's damage to the hull. Uh, the hull, you want to avoid any damage because it's part of the investigation of what actually caused the sinking in the first place. So there are certainly risks, but maybe not on the scale of the Costa Concordia. Nick, just a final question. And uh, of course, we hope you'll come back when the Bayesian is salvaged. What is your gut instinct about what caused the sinking? Yeah, that's, that's, uh, there's been a lot of supposition and the theories on this. So I've seen, especially August, late summer, you get water spouts that go through the Tyrrhenian Sea, the, uh, the Sicilian you know, islands. Um, it was late at night, so I'm not sure if everyone has detail of exactly the intensity of the storm. But you can get a downdraft from these uh, whirlwinds or, or water spouts of certainly well over 100 kilometers an hour. And that 
has two factors. So either it sucks up water and dropped water on the basin, or you get this moving wave in front of it, and you get like a bow wave that actually goes over the deck. Uh, there was reports that the cockpit flows into the saloon, and the saloon doors might have been open because of the, uh, the social environment that was on board. So if you get a large wave-driven wave and, and substantial wave driven by the, by the sudden storm that comes over it, then you have what they call a free surface effect, and you can lose stability re really quickly. Uh, the crew had been called on deck, so obviously there was a warning that you know the the impeding sort of storm was coming. But these things can be very sudden and also quite isolated. So you could have two or three yachts in the bay, and only one of them gets impacted by the full force of these water spouts or, or mini tornadoes. So I think uh, I would imagine that because he's been around. 14, 15 years sailing the oceans, that she's a pretty well-found yacht. So it's not as if she was one year old and this was her first sort of incident to bad weather. But this can be a sudden and extreme weather, well over 100 kilometers an hour winds, and that brings in other factors. So yeah, I, I, would, I would like to think that it was a freak weather phenomenon that caused it. But until they carry out the accident investigation and see the condition of the yacht, then they, they can't rule out the other factors as well. That's right. Nick Sloan, thank you so much for your uh, analysis today. We really appreciate it. Thank you, Matthew. And thank you for watching. You'll find more of our Bayesian content online. We'll hope you'll like, share and subscribe.